Hi there, this is uh, Gord Kubinek for KCOR. I'll be the host today for our presentation by Dr. Alan Betts. Um, I haven't met Alan in person, um, but I feel like I know him. Um, he's from Vermont and uh, we lived and worked in Vermont. My uh, daughter is actually born in Vermont, so we are fellow Vermonters. I, I just found out in the conversation before that uh, he lived in the southeast of England during World War II, and that's where my father lived. So they, uh, my father and Alan also saw the bombers going overhead in both directions. So we have another uh, connection. And uh, I'm mentioning this because the Dr. Alan is going to be talking to you about the connection to the earth and how deep and profound it is. And it's much deeper and much more profound that we can possibly imagine within our current framework. So he's here to challenge you to realize that you and the mother earth are not only figuratively, but still almost physically connected by an umbilical cord that you can't see. And he's going to help you see that connection. Uh, be ready to be provoked. Uh, stay open-minded, of course. That's one of our mantras here at KCOR remain open-minded and uh, enjoy the show. Uh, be aware to repeat again, put your questions in the chat. I will be uh, keeping track of that and I will call your name out in order at the end of the presentation, which will be approximately 45 to 55 minutes. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to hand this over to Alan. Well, thank you, Gordon. This is my first slide and a title here, the Earth's view of climate change. Actually a picture of the Earth at the top left and a picture of me gardening in January about the same date. I'm going to talk about two aspects of this is a huge problem. The climate aspect itself is huge. And the second part of this talk, which is the Earth's aspect and understanding of climate change as it decides to take over, is something you will probably never have heard of, although I think Ray Desjardins has heard it once in some form. But I, it's all written down. In 45 minutes, I can only simply summarize with a few slides. I wrote this paper on the social aspects of climate change, what we as a society on a global scale a little bit biased towards the United States, uh, thinks is going on and it's how we're trying to control it and make money out of it. Uh, that is a huge topic in itself. But having done that last year, this year I was asked for a follow-up paper and I decided it was time that I wrote down my real thoughts on this problem, which go back about 50 years, because essentially I've led a double life. I've led a life as a climate change scientist and I've led a separate life trying to understand the Earth system itself and the Earth's view of climate change. And, and I went looking. The climate part of it, you're all, I'm sure, familiar with from the climate of the Earth is kept in a nice state to sustain life. The greenhouse gases keep the Earth warm. The CO2 and the water vapor are the primary greenhouse gases for that, but CO2 is increasing because we're burning all the fossil fuels and the heat is largely being stored in the ocean. The increased evaporation of water vapor triples the warming of the planet, which is why we're moving into a climate crisis. And also the warming melts ice and snow, and ice and snow keeps the planet a little bit cool because of reflection of sunlight. You know, in the mountains in winter and the poles and the result of the melting of ice and snow as the climate system warms is the poles are warming faster than the earth as a whole. And in fact, the Antarctic is warming fastest of all and our winters warm. There's a discontinuity with the snow on the ground in winter. The oceans are storing the heat because the atmosphere itself has rather little thermal capacity and getting warmer, but extreme weather's increasing. As the Arctic warms, the west is slow down, and then extremes within extremes are occurring, and I'll say a little bit about that later. For me, a gardener in Vermont, and I started gardening there back in 1977, uh, 40 years, 30 years on, my real wake up call was when I found that my cover crop of ryegrass, I could dig it over in January. 
never in my life when I started in the 70s and 80s could I have dreamed of that. I always hung up my spade in November, basically, and had a quiet winter. But when I found it was not frozen, I started digging. Next year was the same, and this went on for a few years, most winters. And then February of 2016, this is my granddaughter digging in the very first time in February. And I took this picture and I cheerfully told her, you must be the first, uh, I've forgotten how old she was then, six or seven years, eight years old, uh, child digging in Vermont since the last interglacial 100,000 years ago. And she gave me that, Grandpa, <laughs> you're out of your mind. I don't know what you're saying. But this has continued. This, that was 16, 20, 20. Here's, I have now here three granddaughters in a row, uh, all digging over in January. And I'm digging in February. And I haven't got a picture of me digging in March. 2020, there was essentially no time when the ground in Vermont, where I live, halfway down the state, was solidly frozen. We have marker lakes in Vermont. The famous long one is Stiles Pond, where the record goes back to 1970. The record of when it froze up in days of the year and when it melted in days of the year. And you can see the convergence of these two line fits. And this is the number of days frozen. And not only is there a line fit, the other thing you can see here is the interannual variability has got larger and larger until now the interannual variability in the last five years is comparable to the 40, 50 year change. Another just glimpse of the climate system. This is the United States, you know, I'm so, so sad we have these hard borders, but we do. Vermont had two record spring floods 10 years ago in 2011, the spring on Lake Champlain and one with tropical storm Irene in the fall in, in late August. And they were connected in the sense that if you look at the six months, this is just the ranking for by NOAA of the precipitation. And the ones here mean Texas and New Mexico were the driest on the 117 record, year record. And Ohio to Vermont were the wettest on the 117 year record, year record meaning that essentially the storm systems all moved across the north that year. That is an example of a stationary frozen pattern, in this case for six months, that we got quite a lot of in that 10 period, nearly stationary patterns, not with what's happening at the moment. So I'm gonna, this is my first outline, and this is really the social aspects, and I'm being very blunt here, but I'm sure most of you will recognize it. We have a so-called okay. climate science policy. Thank you. In which the policy is dictated by the rich and powerful. A global climate crisis has arrived and my emphasis in this talk is that we actually have to shift to an indigenous worldview but we don't, we simply ignore it. What happens in our society is that what I cheerfully called the fossil empire in my first paper dictates the policy by a whole series of manipulations and these are all the corporations that have fossil fuel interests. They have webs of lies to confuse the public, bribe politicians, they've lied about climate change for 40 years. And I'm going to go off on a tangent, but a very important one for you to understand that the misuse of human power is historic. And it fundamentally in the European world view goes back to the Council of Nicaea in 325 when, and I'll come to that with a slide. It goes through the rise of Western science and goes through the destruction wherever possible of the indigenous worldview. What got me involved, directly involved in this was the understanding that science and policy, I was told when I was a young scientist here that we kept them separate. And this was a good idea because scientists was trained to do this. It protects the integrity of science and it's invaluable for global cooperation to keep all the politics out of it. But I realized back in 1976, and I'll show a bit this, because this will come back in a moment, that we cannot solve global challenges when no one is responsible for the global picture. And I realized that this misuse of human power is central both to science and policy and has ancient roots, and it's driving the destruction of the earth. And I realized that science was simply not enough and it needed wisdom, it needed direct insight. And so I went looking back after writing this paper in the late 70s. I thought it was my responsibility from my background, which I 
in England I can't really go into in detail now. To give you a sense though, in that same time frame that I showed you stationary climate, a group of people met on Oregon's Blue River, and this is one of the statements they came out, the Blue River Declaration. A truly adaptive civilization will align its ethics with the ways of the earth. A civilization that ignores the deep constraints of its world will find itself in exactly the situation we face now on the threshold of making the planet inhospitable to humankind and other species. That's a nice statement essentially of the indigenous worldview, but it's not what our society runs on. It runs on, we are in charge. We can exploit the earth and the people for profit. It's based on a financial structure. But the reality that I'm going to stress for you in this talk is this is a joke because the earth is so much more powerful and so much smarter than we are. Now, the indigenous mindset, I'm going to comment on this for a couple of slides because I had no idea of this when I started, that the indigenous Aramaic prophet whose name was Yeshua, Yeshua or Joshua, that we know as Jesus was a real indigenous person who spoke Aramaic, which is a language with multiple levels of meaning. And the indigenous teachings were simply not framed in terms of human power, but the understanding that the creator was within all of creation. And the fundamental central indigenous teaching of Yeshua was just join the creation like I've shown you, and you will see the truth of the web of life, and you'll be set free. The truth will set you free to act on behalf of the creation, not human self-interest. Well, that's absolutely true, <laughs> but it was heresy to power then, it's still heresy to power now, and now it's become critical to the survival of the earth. But I also want to say right at the beginning, because this it may confuse you, this is not a religious issue, because almost all the religions, whatever they are, reject this central truth, in order to protect their own power. And we'll come back onto that tangentially. So although I'm making a statement here about in a religious frame, because this indigenous teacher that most of us in one way or another know, it's not really a religious issue because Christianity kept this belief system for only 325 years. Jesus was executed because this truth is heresy to power, Roman and uh, the Jewish powers. Christianity survived, but was persecuted heavily for till 325 when the emperor Constantine realized this could help the emperor. His wife, we are told, was converted. And he said very simply, he made them a deal they, the Roman and Greek bishops could not refuse. Persecution will end if you destroy the Aramaic gospels because they're incompatible with human power. The Greek one, Greeks understood it and we can always reinterpret it. And they established the concept of human power over nature. That is, they established the power of the Roman emperor for which it was fundamental. And that survived till now. The Aramaic Christians who are Jewish and Assyrian who spoke Aramaic became the heretics. A million or so were killed in the next couple of centuries. And in time, the persecution of the Jewish Christians became the persecution of the Jews. And the Roman church, which was established essentially on terms and structures dictated by the Emperor Constantine, carried the concept of human power over nature through the Middle Ages, basically priests over the people. And to be facetious, God was moved up into heaven so he couldn't interfere. Science arose within that frame with great success. It had some struggle, of course, with the, with the churches at the time, think of the 1500s, but it arose within the power of a nature frame and it critically arose without a moral standards and the concept of wisdom. The Europeans traveled the world they exploited and killed the indigenous people with church support whenever they could, basically because they were horrified, the churches were, that the indigenous people simply recognized the indigenous Jesus. And they basically said to them, our, our teachers have been telling us this for a thousand years. And that was heresy, of course, to the churches. So that was one of the reasons why the indigenous people were definitely stamped out. And you've had issues with that in, Canada. The enslavement of them, the enslavement of people, all those things contained within the European worldview that they were in charge. 
to skip you know, over a thousand years, the European societies, capitalism still rose within this framework without moral standards. The US controlled the global oil supply and price for 70 years, and that's what gave us fossil capitalism and the exploitation of the earth and the pure uh, in, in this capitalistic framework. And there's books on there that I'm not going to go into. A central problem, a fact, was that ExxonMobil's chief scientist, his name was James Black, actually modeled the impact of doubling CO2 on climate and got it right in 1978, which is the year I built my house in Vermont. He told management they only had five or 10 years to be, make critical energy decisions and change direction. He was silenced, the web of lies started, first denial and later the skillful shifts of responsibility to individuals. And in the US, it's typically extraordinarily easy to bribe politicians. And we have 139 Republican climate deniers, and they cost a mere $61 million. Very cheap when you're making billions and billions every year. And they could still claim because that, they, that then the oil companies could claim that the government, not them, were responsible for the situation. But the way I'll just simply frame this is this global ecocide by the fossil empire to keep the profits flowing with political help and large subsidies in the US. And we refuse to bill these criminal criminals who have known for 40 years what they were doing for these costs. So review this first part of this talk. We're burning fossil fuels, transforming the climate, and there are water cycle amplifications, which are of the order of a factor of three. The climate extremes are increasing, stationary patterns, extreme patterns, floods, droughts, heat waves, and fires, all that kind of stuff. I'm not going to discuss any of that in detail. Fundamental issue of avoidance of responsibility for decades. And let me just simplify it to say that a stable climate is incompatible with business as usual. And it's incompatible with the fossil empire dictating the rules and bribing politicians like to, in the United States. This is simply a misuse of our technology and economics, a misuse of human power, and we can solve it. We could have solved it decades ago simply by changing the system guidelines, but that's a moral choice. And we don't make moral choices in capitalism, we make money. We could create an efficient society based on renewable energy. But value-based choices are a moral issue, and I'm going to make the claim here that in order to make them, and it will be extremely difficult for our society to really do that, but they're going to get reminder after reminder in the next few years, we have to shift to an indigenous worldview. And I've been writing about this in the articles I write for the newspapers in Vermont. Uh, this is basically the first one of them, January of 2020. But fundamentally, society has to value the future of life on earth above global ecocide for current profit. So let me step back to my particular path here to get you, so you can have some frame as how I as a scientist tackled this question when I realized what was happening. This article back in 76 in the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society, I was objecting that scientists were being told, me, a young scientist, that they should do what society says. And I said, consider this hierarchy of allegiances from the planet Earth down to a specific research contract, which is paying me money to do something. Occasionally, people's in involvement arises a few categories, but never to the level of the planet Earth. And this is certainly not in the interest of society to worry about that. They're still worried about money. No one accepts responsibility, if I can find my mouse, for the planet Earth. And I said, this is unacceptable, and it means disaster lies ahead. Nice. I couldn't detect the de de define all the details of that, but I realized, and this is 45 plus years ago, disaster was coming. So what I did is I rejected the academic world, I refused tenure, and I built a passive solar house in Vermont with solar panels in 78. And that freed me to go searching. I still went on doing research because the Science Foundation supported me on rolling five-year grants for more than 30 years. I was incredibly cheap because I had zero overhead, but I was freed. And I will, so I'm just going to put up one slide to give you a glimpse of that um, because it's amazing how many things I've connected back to this one little example. In 1980, 
I was asking the question quite widespread, how can science be merged with wisdom? And I've been thinking about this for quite some time since, in fact, I had been in London at the time of the Vietnam War as a grad student, and all these rather brilliant American escapees from the Vietnam War came to London to teach. And I was told, though, in 1980, go and ask Ryogi Ramsarat Kumar in Tiruvannamali in India, he would know. Now, you might find that's a little stunning, but in those days, you simply sent the guy a telegram telling the day and time you're coming, and he would wait. He would be there for you. And this is a man who had set 20 years up on the sacred mountain above Tiruvannamali and 20 years on the temple steps, and now had been moved into a basement apartment across from the temple steps. But even before I got to him, I was transformed because down the road, there is a Brahmana Maharshi, another Indian state, had an ashram, which is basically open to Westerners. I arrived, I was so glad after traveling across India, I slipped into meditation and it was 30 years since he had sat in that room. There was simply an Indian couch and his picture. But I was utterly transformed because within minutes of slipping into meditation in this very, very sacred space, I was taken through my life and I was shown the web of all my connections with the earth and with the creation. And I can't put it into words for you, but I can remember it to this day. I was essentially came out of that utterly. I transformed from a sober scientist who was, had gone looking for something and I didn't know what I was looking for. I emerged ecstatic and utterly joyful for days. I had absolutely no concept that a place could be so sacred that all I had to do was sit down and surrender. And I had no concept then of what, this was the exposure to the truth that set me free. I sat with a living saint, some of you may know such as Sai Baba in India, near there for a few weeks. I was on my way and I learned the indigenous mindset from a Vermont indigenous teacher from the Cherokee tradition, the Venerable Dahani Noahu. And much, much later, I learned the concepts that Jesus had written in Aramaic that I did not, of course, understand from a book called the, uh, it's somewhere in this text, The Hidden Gospel. Basically, what all this experience does was gave me some insight, and I, I'm not telling you the whole story. There's much more of it in this particular text. So try now to shift into the earth system frame. The earth system itself tapped me on the shoulder at many times, so I actually understand the earth system frame. And I have know the earth system can see me at the individual level, as well as the planetary system. We have to make a choice between the earth system and the fossil empire. Well, the choice at that one level is obvious, but you're not few, very few really understand it. What you don't understand is the earth is actually in charge. It is only the indigenous people that have some glimmering of that and the thousand years of trying to suppress that has achieved a lot of, that, of suppression. But think, I'm a gardener and some of you will garden also. The earth is watching you even when you're gardening. So I'm going to explore, just from the, give you a scientific perspective on this, to tap into recent climate disasters and try and present them from the Earth's systems perspective. Now, just saying that is heresy. What? The Earth doesn't have a perspective. We have our token Earth Day, it was this week, last past week, here in Vermont. That's the day when we recognize the Earth. For the rest of the year, it does as it's told. We're the smart people and we're destroying it for profit. Of course, the reality is we are beyond stupid and the earth is actually watching what we are doing. And after 30 or 40 years, it's time scales long, it's decided to do something. So I'm just gonna go through the 2021 climate catastrophes. Obviously the situation is not under our control, but is it under the earth's control? Well, if you start looking at it from the earth's perspective, then it seems the earth is starting to select modes. For example, New York City, tropical storm Henri came by on August the 21, and it set new records for rain rates inside Central Park. 10 days later came along a remnant of this Hurricane Cat 4, Hurricane Ida that had done a lot of damage down in Texas and across the country. 
it doubled those records again, basically. Flooded the New York subways, the roads, the basements. And from the Earth's perspective, this is an attempt to start the process that we have to flood the banks and the financial system until they recognize its ecocide to fund the fossil empire. Of course, that's not the way they're looking at it, but other individuals in our society are starting to realize they have to take responsibility. And from the Earth's perspective, good idea, how long is it gonna take? Texas is a matter of example. It's the linchpin of the fossil empire, thousands of offshore wells. And year after year, we've had lots of hurricanes attempting and doing damage to those offshore wells. In the, in the orders of $100 billion. And I've listed a few here, including the Hurricane Ida, which was a Cat 4 hurricane that came by last year. But back in March of 2021, something that had never happened before happened, which there was an Arctic blast of air that started in the stratosphere over the North Pole, propagated downwards, and then propagated in three waves, specifically down to Texas, and destroyed and froze the power grid, which had never been winterized. And even more important, destroyed the refineries. $100 billion worth of damage and about a year to repair them. From the Earth's perspective, Texas is not going to close its oil wells. Hurricanes and freezes must destroy them. And what we see in the press is the refineries in the US are not at capacity. Northwest US and British Columbia, you're aware of this example, extremes in 27, 28, 9th of June last year, that were four or five degrees Celsius above the historic maximum. And a famous historian of climate made this statement. This was the most anomalous regional extreme heat event to occur anywhere on earth since temperature records began. It broke the all Canadian record, which had stood for 80 years. It was a drought in Saskatchewan by 4.6 centigrade and ended in fires. Now we don't usually break national records by a few more than a few tenths. This was 4.6 and as Canadians, you were affected by this. What I didn't realize <laughs> until uh, the end of the year when I know I was reading up on things is that in November, the phase two from the Earth's perspective came along, the Pacific Atmospheric River, which British Columbia didn't use to suffer from, dumped a month of rain in two days on burnt regions in British Columbia. The landslides closed the Trans-Canada Highway and Railway for a considerable period of time. What was the purpose of this? Well. British Columbia has decided to mine natural gas and liquefy it for export. And this is the earth figuring out how it can cut off this new mining of natural gas and to, to, to attempt to accelerate the destruction of the earth. But then six weeks ago, we had Antarctica. And I don't know if there's any of you who didn't notice this particular one. This was the most staggering event from a global perspective that we have also ever seen. The Antarctic, Eastern Antarctic Plateau, which we thought was stable for a thousand years, was 40 centigrade above the 30 year climatology at the weather station, which has a 66 year record. How did that happen? Well, the earth simply took the desert air over Australia and sent it down to sit over the Antarctic, Eastern Antarctic Plateau. When scientists saw this, they said, if you had Antarctic scientists, if you had told me three days ago that this was going to happen, I would never, never, never have believed you. But it did happen. And the very first ice shelf of Eastern Antarctica broke off. And in overnight, essentially, the issue changes from, oh, well, if the earth can do things like this, oh, we thought we had to worry about the Western Antarctic ice shelf, where there's a lot of things that are much more fragile, and, but there's not as much ice. But if Greenland and Antarctica as a whole can all melt because the earth pushes something there to melt them, oh, the melt of 20, rise of sea level of 20 or 30 feet becomes relatively trivial not a century into the future or a thousand years into the future, but in the next few decades. Uh, and I just note at the same time, North Pole, there were some places 30 centigrade above. So we are actually, no one is really discussing this, of course, but we're facing the issue that we might get one way the earth may decide to deal with the society 
is simply to raise sea level 20 or 30 feet, because that will deal with the banks in New York City. It will deal with the East Coast and West Coast and all the coasts essentially, massive damage on a global scale. We will not be able to control at all. And if we realize that the earth is doing it because it's getting desperate, we might pay some attention. Well, this is a perspective that is definitely challenging. The earth is generating extremes that we have to deal with, but we can't forecast them on all time scales. The earth, even though we have not been taught this, is intelligent and actually responsible for the live, living earth system. And it's able to communicate with all of life. I've experienced this on an individual level when the earth tapped me on the shoulder and said, you're wrong on this, let me show you what is right. And I haven't given you that example in this talk, it's in the paper. My advice to you is you watch the weather, of course, watch the living earth, look at what things are happening and prepare. Prepare is a different word here for you. Realize the earth is aware of your choices as an individual, as well as the global choices that it faces and try to surrender to the earth's frame if you can. It's not something you are trained to do. And the earth will communicate with you in ways that you can barely grasp. But if you look, you can find it and notice it. And I contrast one more time. Our society's attitude is the earth has no perspective or intelligence to protect its interests. That's us. We're humanity. We're so smart and then we're going to destroy it for profit. And this is simply simple. It's simply a misuse of human power. And it's a good thing we're not in charge. If you shift from this mindset with zero wisdom and connect directly to the earth, try it. But it's difficult. You have no training and it fundamentally needs surrender. You cannot tell the earth, please talk to me. Please do what I want. What are you doing? It will not respond to any of that. You have to surrender. And that's very difficult for us people in our society because we've been trained symbolically to fight, fight and never surrender for centuries. Immersing yourself in the natural world is one start, but you need to go a step further, slip into meditative states in the natural world and surrender and see what happens. I'm going off on one more aside. The financial industry, of course, is waiting to eat for economic growth to drive more destruction, destruction of the planet for profit, useless. Global crises, droughts, and the war was, was, was going on in the Ukraine and other useless endeavors at the moment. Manufacturers got scattered, connectivity is crumbling, global trade is crumbling, and everywhere you look, there are emergencies. I referred to a few, but the floods in China have set new records. We nearly lost the Three Gorges Dam last year or the year before, I've forgotten which. Siberian fires are bigger than all the fires on earth. And there are global protests going on by youth and the indigenous, because they have absolutely every right to try and stop business as usual from destroying the earth and stop the rich and powerful who are simply killing our children. So my review of this second part, the climate crisis needs a new perspective, an indigenous perspective of the earth. That is the truth that sets you free. And just to put that in context, we live in a society where the truth and lies are all in opposition. And our society doesn't even think in terms of the truth that sets you free because it's always shifted around to something else, which is my truth will set, you, will set you free to serve me. And whether that's churches or politicians or whatever it is, it is not the truth that sets you free. It's skillful webs of lies to try and trap you so people can make money from you in one way or another. But the truth that sets you free is that the earth's truth, if you understand it and follow it and step into it, you really are free to then serve the earth and the creation itself. We can model a climate system and we do it very well after the fact, up to a point, not in the long term. But now the earth is selecting extreme modes specifically to damage our fossil industrial infrastructure just because it's responsible for saving life on earth. If you step into the indigenous perspective, you can connect with what the earth is doing daily and it will feed you in an indirect way, inspired choices well, through what we call intuition, serendipity 
and deepen your web of connections with each other as well as the earth. So my last slide, discuss this talk among yourselves and listen to the very widespread of reactions. They are the widespread of reactions in society, but also ask who is connected and feels connected to the earth and would like to explore this deeper. Connect back to the earth and report back to you as a group, the K Core group. Send people out, so to speak, at least in, in my, just one at a time. Try to send people out as a couple, couples with diversity, male, female variety, uh, because you would like to understand beyond just the individual level of perspective and see what happens to your group dynamics as well as your relationship to the earth. And I think that's the end of my slides. Yes, that's the end of my slides. And uh, yes, I'm on time. Shift back to you, Gordon. Well, thank you very much, Ellen. I hope our audience has been provoked and has kept an open mind through this. Um, as a, a Franciscan, it, uh, what you say aligns very much with me. So for me, it's, uh, I feel like you live just down the street from me in, in metaphorically. So thank you for that. So I will now put, go with the questions. Uh, first question will come from Paul Beckwith and on deck is uh, Desjardins. I don't have a first name, unfortunately. So, so Paul Beckwith and then Desjardins, please. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, extremely interesting, fascinating talk. Um, I'm wondering if you've given much thought to the uh, some of the um, uh, possible ideas that would remove um, carbon, whether it be CO2 or methane from the atmosphere, and also for uh, you know things to, like solar radiation management, um, many different ideas. Um, you know, have you looked into those things and, and where do they fit into your sort of worldview on the earth? Um, because it would be humanity's way to try to reverse some of the damages that we've done, uh, giving us time to transition to a completely renewable society. I mean, that's clearly very difficult to do and will take time. So if we have some band-aids to um, sort of try to stabilize the climate system um, in the interim while we slash fossil fuels and transition. I mean, that would be, uh, you know, one, you know, that's being looked at seriously right now. Yes, and I, I'm familiar with that, although that's not an, an, my area of expertise. I am, <laughs> I'm not really sure what I'm going to say about it. I'm skeptical in the sense that most places I look, they're being used as band-aids to avoid facing the fundamental issue that we refuse to challenge and stop deliberately destroying the earth by burning all the fossil fuels now. And we've had decades to face this and we have done nothing. So I'm, I think there's a lot to be said for that. And uh, every now and then I read, but I'm not prepared, uh, very specific things from say the solar radiation management perspective which is combined with all of life on earth and particularly forests, life on earth, that there are questions and issues there that have not been resolved. And the impact on the tropics in particular could be catastrophic, but I'm not really the person to answer that question. Great, well, thank you very much for that, Paul. Uh, next question is from Desjardins and on deck is John Mayer, okay? Here we go, Desjardins. For an interesting talk, uh, talk provocating talk. Um, uh, and we've worked together on many major ecosystem and uh, and uh, done a lot of work over the boreal forest together, for example. And and I'm quite concerned when the government's plan of planting two two billion trees to uh, tackle climate change. What what is your view of that? And. <laughs> Ah, you're asking me the climate, climate questions. You yeah. know how difficult that a question is, is to answer. We're still puzzling through the ways in which trees, clouds, the climate system, the water budget, and all these things are interacting. 
and we don't have it all together and we don't have it all together for different parts of the globe the boreal forest and the tropics are not the same and i can't give you hard on nothing that i have said about taking the earth's perspective here is going to answer that for you because i cannot step into the mindset of the earth and decide how it's going to deal with the forest systems in the face of climate change. So I can't actually answer those type of questions for you. I can do research, classical research again, but you can, you just need to get that set of experts together on all the parts of that problem. We still don't know the answer to it. There was some, I read, I saw some new research papers just last week. And, but I'm moving into the point where I can't do all that research. I can help you a bit. Do you have to formulate some of those questions? Yeah, the, the reinforcing is certainly a, a, a thing that we, we need to consider more. Uh, and and uh, the fact that you showed me, you, you wrote some papers showing that net radiation over boreal forests is 10 watt per meter square more more than over grassland so that's a, a big factor that the... yeah there there it is and uh, that particular bit of data couldn't have been based on too much maybe on our aircraft trajectories and the twin air twin otter over the forest because we don't have the long term as much long term data in this inside the forests thank you thank you someone thank had you. a question on the gaia hypothesis and i don't uh, know that's coming later i guess All right. All right. So <laughs> I, we'll I saw sure, it on my screen. We, 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 we'll make sure we get there. Uh, so next is John Mayer, and on deck is Andrew Welsh. So hey, John, you're on, and Andrew is on deck. Alan, uh, thanks. I, I thought what you were uh, covering was essentially the Gaia uh, uh, approach. But my question is, uh, several climate scientists uh, in the past year have made presentations to this group, and they've mentioned what they regard as uh, pivotal events, uh, which might uh, send us off into a, uh, on a on a decline from which we cannot recover. And in my mind, uh, I think it's been presented that uh, the a blue ocean event, uh, when the first time a uh, uh, the Arctic Ocean uh, becomes totally ice free that at that point uh, there's uh, we can try as best we can but there's nothing we can do uh, and i think we regard the climate uh, as a mechanism and you have presented it as a conscious being so is there a, a point at which you feel uh, there will be a uh, there there could be a, a conscious a, a threshold event beyond which this conscious being will not be able to recover to the point where uh, recover itself to the point where uh, human society will not be able to survive at a reasonably sophisticated level anywhere on this planet is, is it one event that you you would see as a sign <laughs> i feel you're mixing up apples and oranges a little bit the earth and I, I'm trying to untravel them. <laughs> we can certainly lose the Arctic Ocean and melt it, and we can have catastrophic melt from that, which mm -hmm. will push up sea level and have an impact. But from the Earth's perspective, is appears I'm going to say it's probably a good idea at the moment because we as a human society refuse to deal with this. So we need reminders in every possible way we can. But what when you said forgotten what your words with the fallacy in what you said is that the we think we human beings are the most important people on this planet and you made some allusion to could the earth continue save us that is not an agenda for the earth the earth at this point is faced with the fact that for decades now we have been deliberately destroying the earth by refusing to confront the fossil fuel empires with their destruction of the planet. We've refused to make the transition to renewals because there's too much money at stake. 
And from the Earth's perspective, that's unacceptable behavior for the ecosystem of the Earth as a whole, of which we are only one part. Mm -hmm. If we change direction, the Earth will say, hmm, they're learning a bit. They're learning a bit. And it's, the Earth has the capability to, in fact, shift and manipulate the climate change system in out to protect us as well as the rest of the ecosystem of the Earth. In my opinion, it's not doing that at the moment because it said it realizes that we, our industrial infrastructure has to be destroyed to save the Earth at this point. And figuring out creative ways to do that, fast ways to do that, that we can do nothing about is what it's engaged in. But I'm kind of speaking for the Earth when I recognize that the Earth's understanding of this entire living system that it is in control of, in language that you could just view as religious, but it is not. It transcends all our religions. The Earth is a living, intelligent creation. The creation, the creator, and the living earth system are together. And we have not grasped that. Our religions haven't grasped it because they had to transform it all into human power terms. It's not there to protect us human beings. It's not there to destroy us. It's something we can work with if we are willing to cooperate and understand. And it will notice immediately but I can't answer, I, I'm, I'm evading your question more than answering. Because you, you've, answered it, you, you've answered it quite well, I think. Uh, and, and that is that uh, it, it's making, uh, essentially from our point of view, it's making up its own rules uh, that we don't understand. And that uh, I didn't imply that earth would go out of its way to save us. Uh, I, I, uh, the, the point was that uh, would it happen to settle uh, on a, a level of uh, stability where we could survive. I, I don't We will find that, out. Yeah, the, the climate is, uh, the earth systems are indifferent to whether we live or, or not. So that, that's not the question. Anyway. They're uh, not indifferent because they're intelligent and watching. Okay. That's a different answer. Yeah, it is. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you very much, John. Um, I hope you guys, everybody, the gentlemen and ladies out there are enjoying this to and fro back and forth um I'm, i certainly am so next question is from andrew welch and then on deck is dave doherty so andrew and then dave on deck hi thanks very much really enjoyed the talk um in that talk you make uh connections that you argue are not coincidences uh, and you also put a lot on the fossil fuel empire, um, which I think is, is interesting that we, we talk about maybe corporate greed when I would say there's no such thing as, as corporate greed. If it has no sufficiency, there's no way of defining excess. We program that to be uh, maximizing profit. So is it coincidence, it's my question, that um, graphing the growth of monetary wealth, for example, follows a positive feedback curve, the same kind of exponential curves that we see in climate change. Would you, would you say that these things might be indeed connected and not a coincidence, and that perhaps it is our predominant value system uh, that is uh, behind what we're seeing in terms of a climate emergency? Well, it's not my field of expertise, but the answer is yes. I would assume that the exponential growth mentality, exponential growth of everything from population to profit uh, is all connected with the destruction of the planetary system. And when I said that back in the 70s, I looked at the fact no one was willing to look at the consequences of what we were doing on the earth. And that was a catastrophe that was definitely coming and I still think it was I was absolutely right that that catastrophe was coming and uh, we have all sorts of economic arguments but I had the flat statement in there which I would support is that our growth economic society is incompatible with a stable climate on several levels so uh, just to follow up then uh, the, the the solution might be in terms of adopting 
uh, indigenous sustainable value systems that can last for you know 10,000 years without having that kind of feedback loop, without having that kind of exponential curve. Well, of course, but we have refused and done everything we can to destroy them from the mentality of our system, our education, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And the transformation back there is heresy to our political and economic and capitalist system. So absolutely, our capitalist system is quite happy, so to speak, to destroy the earth to maximize profit. Thank you. And they don't like being told that. No, no. <laughs> they have all sorts of rationalizations to defend what they have done. But it's obvious to almost anybody, and it's obvious to me as a scientist. Well, I think one of the rationalizations might be that they are nimples in that they say, not in my perceived life expectancy. <laughs> um, they seem to be going extinct because it's becoming their life expectancy. Might that be good news? Well, I, oh, right. But the. Um, my perspective is, I don't know what the right word is. So that's your callous attitude towards your children and grandchildren? Yeah. <laughs> callous, that you're basically willing to murder them for a belief system and a belief system that, I'll be actually explicit, is a basic web of lies. There is almost nothing in our society, social system, if you don't look at it a little more closely, that doesn't some isn't basically a set of lies to protect a set of opinions, whether they're political or evangelical or whatever they are within the, this society. They are all webs of lies. And with fact that we as a society, it's very obvious at the moment in the United States, uh, have these webs of truth and lies on political sides. And if you, you can side with one side or the other, but on some level, there's lies within each of those attempting to justify human power structures. And the fundamental thing I'm saying is that the justification of everything in terms of human power is doomed to fail. Doomed to fail because it has made one central fallacious argument that the earth will do as it's told or at least it can be destroyed. Or we can construct you know, radiation management or something or other downstream. And we're wrong. I, 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 didn't, I didn't give the example, it's in my thing. The earth once just suspended gravity for only 20 or 30 seconds, with me a scientist watching when I was sitting meditating in the Adirondack Mountains, simply suspended gravity and picked me up and showed me where I was wrong on in something that is outside your experience, which is the, the way the dances to the four directions come, are taught in special situations by the earth. Now, as a scientist, I should not be saying that the earth can suspend the law of gravity, but I was a scientist there sitting, watching, and I knew immediately, I was sitting cross-legged and I rose to, into a new dance form I did not know, and I could tell immediately that I was being taught. The earth could not only read my fallacious understanding of the problem, but it saw an opportunity to show me what the truth was of how the earth could teach indigenous people, in this case, the dances for the four directions. I thought that, you know, then smart native teachers created these things wrong. But the, from a scientist's horror there, I actually had to watch the suspension of the law of gravity. You can't get up from a cross-legged position not using your hands on a huge 10 foot wide rock. I cannot do it anytime, never in my life. But I didn't have to, I flowed. And I, my science mind was watching with a, not exactly a grin. <laughs> All I had to do was surrender. I don't know where I got off on that tangent, but it's, thank you. Thank you for the tangent, and uh, thank you for the good conversation there between the two of you. Uh, next, we have Dave Doherty, and on deck is William Reese. Go, Dave. Yes, I'm uh, the one who brought up the idea of the Gaia hypothesis, and I wanted to know what you think of that. Uh, in particular, whether you think we're seeing the revenge of Gaia. I wonder if I could add to it uh, for your opinion as to uh, how it could be that we have, in fact, had various indigenous populations uh, that have collapsed under their own weight. And I suppose 
Uh, the first one that comes to mind is the Maya in the Yucatan. <laughs> As a whole, I can't answer for the indigenous populations around the world over the last few thousand years. And what, where and where they were honest and followed something and where they were involved in warfare and this and that. So I'm not going to go there. The Gaia hypothesis... Uh, has an element of truth, yes, but it's not something that I wave my hands over because the, well, as soon as you mention, say, the revenge of Gaia, I don't think the Earth system that I know understands a concept of revenge. It understands the concept of choice, but it doesn't work in human terms. And the concept of revenge is very much a militaristic, warfare-related human concept. It has okay, a the, very little relationship to the Earth system itself. Okay, so Lovelock wrote, the, go on. Yeah, Lovelock wrote several books. The mm -hmm. title of one of them was The Revenge of Gaia. Yeah. And it sounds very much like what you're saying in that uh, my reading of it was, he was saying the Earth will control itself. And if something gets out of control, the Earth will deal with it correct okay okay that, so that sounds to me very much like what you're saying if we if we're intent on destroying the earth the earth's going to control us well yes but i would i would not use the term revenge of the earth i <laughs> that's a human term it's not part of the earth's perspective perspective of the planet as a whole but you're right the, 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 what he was, Lovelock was saying, and I don't know where, what I'm lacking is an understanding of where he got his concepts from. And I, I know where I got my concepts from. I was lucky enough to be sitting in various places when the earth noticed me. And since I, my science observation was still watching, my understanding was unequivocal. I don't know where, and I, so at the same time, I think it would be fair to say that I view the earth, its relationship to the individual human mind as having a certain sense of humor. What, able to watch and influence if we are able to listen, but not the concept of revenge doesn't come in there at all. Okay, thank you. And thank you very much, so David. much of our, uh, so much of our thinking in our society has all these negative strands of conflict and things, none of which will help us solve these issues. We actually have to face them. And if you have to sigh, yes, and I definitely sighed when I, for a few days when I noticed uh, a year or two ago that it looked to me as if the specific events that we were seeing were now in directly attacking our fossil infrastructure. And I, for a while, all I did was when I saw something like British Columbia as an example, I had no idea why British Columbia, I thought was an innocent part of Western Canada, why it should be targeted by new waves of event. And I simply typed into the web, British Columbia and fossil fuel and all the stuff about the new industry to develop the liquid fine natural gas thing came up. And I said, oh, well, good reason here. I mean, I knew what was going along on the Southern coast. Well, I thought I knew it, but I didn't have a clue about the developments on off Louisiana coast, which was being treated the same as Texas. Mm -hmm. Lots of coal being exported from Vancouver as well, because it can't get out of American ports. It can't. <laughs> Your trans-Canadian highway and railroad systems are going to be targets. Unfair. That, that sounds to me a little bit like revenge. Well, it is in human terms. Okay, it is revenge. It's not in the Earth's perspective. This is what are we? What can we save, and how can we slow down the destruction of the Earth? by human stupidity. Mm. And directly tied to the Gaia hypothesis, uh, if, you were if you were thinking about it as let's say some being being the CEO of the earth, how do I maintain life on the earth? 
that's the question being answered. Oh, look, we got a problem over there. Well, I'm going to deal with that. The Earth is a million times smarter than you are, and Lovelock, and me, because think about it for a moment. If you equate that heresy, that the creation, the creator, and the Earth system are working together, are the same, basically, and they have been for millions of years, in fact, billions of years. Oh, we can't take over that responsibility. What we thought we could do is simply do what we wanted. And it's proving on many different sides of this coin that we can't. Mm -hmm. But I can't fill you in on what is going to happen in detail. I can suggest that you can become part of the process if you change your thinking and your attitude. And you can even step into direct relationship with the living earth system and it will be happy. I'll give you an, it just came to mind again. One of the things that we as in our superior intellect have trouble with is that when a tidal wave is coming across the Pacific, we map it with satellite and we model it and we know when it's coming and we can warn human beings. But a person with wild animals don't have access to that satellite data. And when it's coming and it's still hundreds of miles away, hours away, they simply go to higher terrain. And we look at them and say, how did they do that? Who told them? How did they get that information? And in, if they have indigenous or smart leaders, they just go with them. And we see this all the time, but we don't have an explanation for it. And the explanation is very simple. The earth simply tells them, oh, the earth can't do that, but it does. We see it all the time. We see this direct interaction between the living earth system and species at the individual level. It's just that we aren't listening. We human beings don't listen. We've been trained not to listen because we are the ones with the brains that are smart. And the concept of surrendering and listening like the, the animals that just run to higher terrain on the coast when there's a tidal wave that's still way, way out of their range. If all the rest of life on Earth can listen to the Earth, why don't we actually start to think about that process again? Perhaps because we're actually homo stupidicus. Well, <laughs> you can relabel us, but labeling us doesn't solve the problem. <laughs> okay. Thank you, you very much. Thank, Thank you very much. much. And Ellen, fascinating conversation. Uh, next, we have a question from William Reese, and on deck is John Purdy. So, William, go. Well, thank you very much, and thank you, Alan, for a very interesting uh, talk. I'd like to make two comments first. One about indigenous peoples. I think it's important, and I speak now as a, a population and evolutionary ecologist. Um, human beings are very large, energy-demanding mammals. And what the record from many different branches of science shows is that when humans invade virtually any ecosystem, it's accompanied by the extinction of large numbers of indigenous animals and plants as a result of overharvesting. The human population grows and then collapses. And then over time, the resident humans develop a stable relationship with their remnant ecosystem. But we interpret that then as, as indigenous wisdom. My point is that the record seems to suggest that we come to that wisdom the hard way because uh, nature uh, feeds back. Uh, we respond initially by expanding into a habitat, grow extraordinarily according to our you know, exponential capacity, and then we crash. Okay, so I don't think there's any partic anything particularly magical about the indigenous experience. Secondly, I, I think we don't need to ascribe motivation to the planet or anything to explain what's going on here. I mean, humans evolved under very, very simple conditions. We interacted with relatively few people in relatively constrained home ranges. And so our brains have evolved in a way that uh, is adapted to simple concepts and simple situations. In fact, I would argue that the human brain is now obsolete. In fact, humans are obsolete because we have created a world 
of mind-boggling complexity of overlapping systems, any one of which is beyond human comprehension. Nobody really understands the economy or geopolitics or even the internet, or certainly not the climate system or the ecosphere. And these things are all now interacting in ways that are simply beyond the comprehension of any human mind. And so the, the thought that we're in control, and you're absolutely right about this, is an absurdity. We don't understand it, let alone controlling that yeah, control it. It's like trying to run the planet sitting on a little toy car, uh, you know, that a child might pedal around on the living room floor thinking he's in control. So we don't really get it. We're completely out of it. And the fact of the matter is that we've become aliens on the very planet that we've created. I don't mean the planet we've created, but the system, socioeconomic system within which we happen to reside on the planet. And the earth will select us out. We've become maladaptive on the earth because of our own ineptitude or stupidity as they would call it. And uh, earth will simply select us out. This is Darwinian natural selection. Uh, the big brain experiment was a, was a mutation and it failed. And uh, after we've disappeared, life will continue for another three or four billion years until, until the sun goes nova. What do you think of that? Well, I agree with you to quite a bit. And I use the word indigenous uh, as a contrast with our society, recognizing that many of the things in indigenous society also uh, reflected the failures and misuse of human power and the collapse of societies. But the, I, I think if you step into the world of the earth, and I, I know the earth has a level of intelligence that I had no idea at the beginning of my search. And that's from my own direct experience. So I know that I, but I can't transfer that to you. We're, we are, we're not necessarily going to go obsolete because I still think that human beings, despite everything that you say about our society, which is true, have the capacity to step out of our small, limited old worlds, which are very much based on conflict. We haven't shown the capacity to do that yet, but we are going to be, we are going to kind of understand as step by step what happens the earth decisions that the earth makes, we're going to see them and someone is going to start to interpret them intelligently. So I don't think we're necessarily going to go extinct, but <laughs> uh, oh. that's typically our either or human mentality reflected in what you'd accurately describe as the history of our civilization as a, our human beings and our evolution in the last million years or so. I, I agree that, you know, there are some people who probably have a grasp of things. But look, if you look at the world today, uh, people such as Putin. Yeah, are, I agree. <laughs> Perfect absolutely, example. Absolutely. It's a, an in control of unfathomable power that we don't really understand. And if he were to do something insane, which many people think he is now tending toward, and the world responds in an equivalently insane manner, then it's over. It's not, no, it's not going to be over. That's sure, not, not going to go. Civilization is over. We may survive as a species, but that's a wholly different game. And it but, will mean a dramatic population correction and the death of billions of people. That's what we're up against here. And nobody seems to want to open that door and look inside. No, I know. I can see I'm watching that every day also. Okay. And, you know, and, and, and the irony, we will not look into and honestly face all the criminal things that the United States did in Vietnam and invading Iraq and all the webs of lies it, that Putin's afraid of. And so we're bo both sides here are living in webs of lies. And Putin is a beautifully classic example. And, but... I hear you, but I have an advantage that I know the Earth system is a lot smarter than us. I'm not disputing that. By the way, the so, web... Well, we will see. 
the webs of lies you're talking about are characteristic of what sociologists call the social construction of reality. So you're quite right. We, we it's web a social construction, but it's not reality. Not, well, uh, yeah, it's social construction of perception through lies, quite so. And it's a complete mismatch with reality. But again, that's because we're obsolete. We, 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 well, we're a mismatch for the world in which we've... We have to deal with our obsolescence uh, and re reform ourselves, encourage the generations that are younger than you and I, that are yeah. not as quite white bearded, um, because yes, the older generations are obsolete, absolutely. Good luck with that, my friend. Thank you very much for this discussion. I'll cheer if I just cheer for them. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. And we've got now John Birdie with his, Birdie with his question and Mike Nickerson is on deck. John, you're up. I can't hear you. You're silent. Somewhere your mic is not on. John Birdie, are you there? Uh, he's talking, but he's not audible to me. Yeah. No, he's not audible to anyone. Move on to the next question. Okay, so John will, time will come, John. Later. And Mike Nickerson, you're on, and Mary Hagen is on deck. So, M Mike, you're on. You're silent as well, but you're muted. I can deal with that. Thank uh, thanks very much for your presentation. I'm delighted to hear, uh, you know, consciousness on a planetary scale being acknowledged. Uh, in my youth, I was uh, told by someone that consciousness and matter are not distinguishable, that they're part and parcel of the same thing. And for every level of organization of matter, there's a corresponding level of consciousness. Um, I've not seen anything to contradict that, and it becomes more and more obvious uh, as I observe. So obviously something as organized as the planet uh, it has a consciousness and uh, it sits very much in, in that, uh, that framework for me. My, my project, my work is to look at the cultural activity of human beings. Like so much of what we do is based on production and consumption. And we're suggesting that we start to redirect that ambition towards um, more what the possibilities of being human are. We, we, we use this, uh, uh, you know, basic, uh, you know, meme as a way of saying, let's, let's live for life and just manage the material world in a way that keeps body and soul together. Is that any comments uh, related to that? It's a great idea. I, uh, I have no, no, no objection to any shift away from a materialistic view towards one that involves human understanding, collaboration, playfulness, joy, and I'm just, all I'm doing is adding to that the suggestion that you step also into the creator's world itself. It's not as difficult. You have, we have constructed societies to make sure people don't do that because it is an insult to human power. And it's much easier than you think. What was the question? Mm -hmm. Well, his, his was the question. <laughs> yes, sorry, no, I was, I had to take a call. I just- It's okay. Yeah. Also, yeah. Okay. You can restate it if you like. Uh, yes, yes. I, I, I was, I don't think I, I, my memory is fading. So my ability to, to I, mean, I don't know your background and where you learned that in your childhood, that everything was conscious. And I, I see your slogan about stepping from materialism into joy. And that's, joy is always a very, very good path. It, uh, it seems like a human characteristic that we can really work with. And, uh... You can really work with it, absolutely. Um, in this whole world of the challenges we face, it often comes up, I think, in our generation, the older generation, that, oh, this is tragic, 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 the catastrophe that we face. And... Oh, I've lost the thread of the real gem there. I, I, I do not share it at all. I do not share it because to me, the understanding that the earth system is conscious, alive, and in a sense, in charge in a level that is above and broader than us, as well as understanding us at the individual level, is, is transformative. It's simply transformative. We're in good hands. Mm. 
Yes. I, I, I when people get this um, <clears throat> discombobulated by their fear of what's happening, I point out that nothing has really changed. They're just one death per person, same as always. And you only have the moment, the present moment right now, and it's up to you what you do with it. It is up to you what you do with it. And I'm simply, in a sense, all I'm doing is broad, trying to broaden your perspective of what you can do with this moment. Absolutely. So that you can essentially look out into the, the natural world and realize you, it's a two-way connection is possible there, even at the level of consciousness not just at the level of direct experience and listening to the birds. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nick. And what we've got next is uh, Mary Hagen with her question. And then on deck, we have John Purdy. So Mary, you're on. Where's Mary? I think Mary, she has, she has she left the neighborhood. There? And Hello. Is John, John is there and he's now. She's oh, yeah. gone. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you, John. You okay. I, I just comment briefly. The first comment is that it's looking at it from your point of view, it's just too bad that the earth is not party to the Paris Agreement. <laughs> but, but going beyond that, I think the most valuable indicator of what's going on is sea level rise. It has gone up by 10 centimeters so, so far. And if you look up previous records, in the past it went up to 8.5. And that's meters, not centimeters. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And according to the IPCC, see that the sea level rise will continue for centuries and probably millennia. So I think that's what we have to look at and that's what we have to take appropriate action to stop it. And emissions won't stop it. It will continue to rise even with zero emissions. So we have to remove the excess CO2 from the atmosphere, period. Well. I think we're going to see sea level rise much faster than those predictions, and we will have to deal with it because uh, we have so much infrastructure on the coasts everywhere. But you're right. We, at some point, it'd be nice to put the CO2 that we just took out of the ground in the last century so we could burn it and drive our industrial society. And there I see every week or two, I see some new method of taking CO2 out of the atmosphere and putting it back. So we will work on that. So I'm no disagreement with you. I just think the okay. sea level rise is going to come faster. I, I don't agree with that. If you look at it carefully, it's been linear for about 20 years since they've been measuring it with the satellites. Yeah. And yeah. that's because it is not being affected by the current emissions. It's affected by what's already there. Well, we will see. But the, the, the okay. warming at the poles is getting more extreme. And uh, the, the warming of Antarctica is actually three or four times the warming of the plant as a whole. And we have not really taken into consideration what might happen in the next few decades. We'll find out. I don't know. Thank you okay. very much. Thank, thank, thank you very much, John. Um, I did find the question. Mary Hagen is no longer with us, but I do have her question. So I'm gonna ask her question on her behalf. It goes like this. Uh, what parts of human nature will help us listen to nature that will make nature our true home? From your experience, what are the key triggers that will decide to adopt nature as our friend and our home? <laughs> I don't think I'm the one to answer that because I went into this search, so to speak, as a scientist and not as a, a nature lover. Uh, no, I was brought up in the natural world and I was a gardener as a kid because we grew our own vegetables after World War II. Um, 
to me, the key issue is to realize there's something beyond and surrender. And that I flag it as surrender simply because our society was not trained to surrender at all. It's trained in militaristic imagery. But I, The first experience that I had on a slide there was not in the natural world at all. I was simply sitting in a, a meditation room of a saint who hadn't been there for 30 years. And he said almost nothing. By Western standards, he said nothing. He written, wrote nothing. He simply sat there and people came every day for, let's say, 20 or 30 years. But the place, as I said in the text there, I had no idea as a staid scientist who'd flown on these grand experiments, that's another part of my history, um, I had no idea that a place could be so sacred that all you had to do was just sit down and not even knowing it, I just slipped into meditation, relieved I had made it across India and across this and across that, <laughs> and surrender. I'll, can I go off on a diversion here? I will go off on a diversion. I was on my way to Kiev, Kiev in the Ukraine, for a meeting with the Russian scientists that I had been on all these, this grand experiment in the gate experiment, in fact, in the tropical Atlantic. And I flew from Tiruvannamali in India through Delhi to Kiev, probably through Moscow. What I had no idea and you probably have no idea, is how far along those Russian scientists were from the rest of the scientists of the world. As soon as I arrived, and they knew I'd come from India, they all crowded around me, trying to learn everything that I had learned from India. And I was, of course, a little bit stuck. In fact, everywhere I went along that way, when someone interrogated me in Moscow on what I'd been doing, as soon as they knew I was from India, they said, do you have any books typically. Do you have this? Do you have that? Can you share it with us? Those Russian scientists, to my amazement, they were, it's hard to put it into words, and they were in Kiev, remember. Um, they had access to the world's wisdom because they had to look for it. And they could buy books from of wisdom from all over the world, and they shared it among themselves. There were about half a dozen of them. They understood it in ways the Western scientists didn't understand at all. And I would say, laughingly, how can you import all this stuff? I thought there were sensors and world, blah, blah, blah. And they said, and they said you, you don't understand at all. I can't import a thousand Bibles, but these tracts we get from around the world on wisdom, the sensors haven't the faintest idea what they mean. They don't understand them at all. So we can import everything, and we do share it and talk about it, and we understand what's going on in the world. That was a staggering experience to understand Russian society in 1980, Russian scientific society in 1980. That's a total aside, but it's, in, but it's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, yeah, we get the idea there's other, there's so much more magic and mystery out there than we can imagine. And we are, we don't share a lot of it. It's not a lot of it is shared. And I, I, I'm not personally in touch with some of them. Then some of them were older than me, so I'm not sure they're with us anymore, but yes. Thank you. Um, We've got only a few minutes left. So minutes for more, more, que more questions. There are two time for two more questions. So I've got Bill and then on deck. So Bill Tyson is on and then on deck is Bill Pugsley. And then, uh, then we'll be done for today. Of course, I get to ask the last question. So, uh, that three. So, Bill Tyson first. Bill Pugsley, you're on deck. Okay. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Thanks very much. That was a very interesting talk. You raised a number of interesting perspectives. Uh, I actually have two points to make. I hope that's going to leave enough room for the other speakers. Um, I enjoyed your uh, anecdote about the spring coming earlier and earlier every year. We see this in Ottawa too. We have a sp spring festival and every year the tulips seem to come up earlier and earlier. Uh, but my, my points are that uh, we seem to be agreed that we're in deep doo-doo. Uh, the question is how we got here and what to do about it. 
uh, I was interested that you uh, presented Yahweh as the first ecologist. And, and I kind of blame Yahweh for part of our problem because what he said, I think it was in Genesis, was to go forth and multiply. And we have gone forth and we've multiplied far too much. We now are overpopulated by many factors. And I wonder if, if you have any idea of how we might get back to something sane uh, without disaster. Uh, the, the, the second point I wanted to make was that we seem to be uh, linked to an economic system that is dedicated to perpetual growth, which is really the source of our problem. The economists have even gone so far as to call their, their discipline a science and have given them themselves a Nobel Prize. And I wonder, as a scientist, if this causes you any great chagrin. Well, the, the growth system, wherever it is, exponential growth is incompatible with a stable equilibrium climate or any kind of stability. And uh, you raised two examples of that, um, but the economic growth is clearly insane, but it's how we have formulated our society. What was your other example? Well, the population growth is another classic example. Uh, in a world where it's, we cannot control our population at all. People, we have to grow our population in order to feed the economic growth and the material growth. And we feel have to buy more stuff. Uh, it's all insane. What was, you had the, what was your first question? I was just wondering how, how you, whether you saw any way to get out of this with a catastrophe. Change direction. It's not, we've been, stop just talking about it look at why we refuse to do it which is to make money and as a system wherever you happen to live, change direction i can't do that for you i cannot do it for our societies and basically that means back the younger generation who understand the issue and I hope they do everyone that has every possible method. You know, we will refuse to discuss why China became the global state economic power it is. It did because it controlled population first. We refused heresy, 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 but it did it and it stabilized the population so that now most people in China consider it whatever. They should not have more than two children. And, and the growth people who came into China are now worried because they're not got the growth of population they need to generate the capitalistic model. But they made the right decision at the beginning to stabilize population. So they became the global economic power because they had a stable population and they refused to work around it in other ways. Immigration might help them, for example. I don't know, I'm not gonna solve that problem for them. But we on the West said, this is heresy. They, 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 they allowed people to, they told people, in fact, you can't have more than two kids. It may, may, may have been one or sometimes. Heresy, heresy, heresy. And look what's happening if, across the old border in, in the United States, where <laughs> it's become the right wing belief system that Trump has supported that we must ban abortion. We must ban all methods of controlling population so we can have more Trumpists or whatever, we, whatever the fantasy beneath that is. And the religious groups as well that have the same set of fantasies. They are all in compatibility with stability of the global ecosystem for reasons that you and others have said. Thank you very much. And our last official question is from Bill Pugsley. So Bill, shoot. Where's thank you, uh, thank you, Gordon, and thank you, Alan, for a, a stimulating talk. Uh, my question has to do with uh, where, and I'm, I'm, I've never been to Sweden, or uh, I have been to Norway. Uh, where do you think the thinking in various countries come closest to what you are advocating, which is uh, surrendering to nature, or at least accepting uh, the the need to um, adapt to nature, as it were. Um, think, and I only bring out Sweden because of the thinking among younger people interested in climate change, like Greta Thunberg, uh, who uh, 
outright challenge many of the short range materialistic uh, approaches, which are at odds with uh, nature. Any comments on that? Well, you're absolutely right. Um, I don't know them personally well enough to know more than what I read in the press. And certainly Greta was a, a, is a clear example of someone who at whatever her age was, 15, 16, understood the problem far better than any of the political and economic people in the world. And we've tried to keep her under control and for the most part it appears we're succeeding. <laughs> uh, but maybe it's the Scandinavian countries have have a respect for human society and relationships and all the things that say in the United States in particular we will not accept as they actually look after their population they look, have healthcare systems that look after people they allow people to control and choose their population sizes and they don't have all this neurosis uh, quasi-religious control over what the societies can and can't do. So in our worldview, they're considered somewhat socialist. And there is, even though the word socialist is heresy to many in the political world, the attitude of being responsible for your society, for your community, and for the nature and for the earth itself is a socialist viewpoint. And it, we, we should relabel it, but we, the problem is we, all our labels, most of our labels are wrapped up in lies. The word socialist gets wrapped up in a lie uh, along with communists and along this, this, all the things that others in the Western world, UK, I won't speak for Canada, US, um, don't like. So, I would say choose and say, yes, this makes perfect sense. Let's do it. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So here's the, the uh, me as the director of all this, get to ask a question at, and then I'm gonna have Ted Manning give you an official thank you. Um, you mentioned several times having a direct relationship with the earth. And you did mention once very, very briefly about uh, methods to do that being meditation and immersing yourself in nature. Uh, I, um, I write a weekly article for our website, which is what are you doing? And I think it might help people here to leave with the things of what could I do? Once again, not prescriptive, just, you know, think about this. What could I do if I'm listening to this to de develop my own direct relationship with the earth? Mm -hmm. So, what could our audience do? You asked me to answer that question for you. Yeah, like there's a hundred ways, but what, you know, what has worked for choose you? One, be... Yes, choose one for yourself, one that will work for you, and go out and try it. Because the, the concept I'm simply getting you to start with, to realize there is something out there to connect with. Our society has not encouraged that. It is not part of our educational system. It's never been part of our religious system because it's way too dangerous for religions. Someone made an allusion to the Yahweh in the past. The translations of many things from the ancient texts into say English are all been done skillfully to suppress what they actually meant. But that's another aside. Um, I can't tell you an individual. I can tell you there is something out there to connect with go out and try. I can accept the that. way that works for you and will satisfy other aspects. The natural world will always help you to understand what's going on inside you, comfort you, bring you joy, connect you to the wider world than just what we think. And then come back with that. Come back to you as a group and say, well, I did this and my word, whatever it is. Right. Right. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And Ted, 
please give our wonderful presenter uh, your thank you. Yeah, I'm delighted to be asked to respond. Alan, you're raising some very telling questions. And in fact, we have already a number of things set up to sort of follow in the same directions. Uh, you are saying that the earth is trying to talk to us and uh, we know we're trying to talk to the earth. Uh, the communications remains a real challenge. Uh, just a very quick thing to say, there will be a session happening on the 27th in Boston, the 50th anniversary of the Club of Rome, uh, of the writing of the limits to growth. And we're bringing a lot of people together and one of the events that's following on is attempting to replace the metric of growth with the notion of well being and what all of the other values are that perhaps the planet is trying to tell us. So, that said, I would thank you very much. And I'm inviting all of the people, by the way, to that session on the 27th. It will be uh, available live for anyone who wishes to go to Boston and it will be on our website. And also it will be uh, streamed over the same system as soon as we get that set up. It'll have the, we'll have the actual uh, documentation of exactly how to get on it and when. Uh, the, uh, I'm really standing in today for Jean Doherty because she is our president and she was not able to make it here today. So as vice chair, I'm trying to uh, give our official thank you to Alan for stimulating a very, very interesting conversation. And you just have to read the chat, chat to see just how rich it has been. Uh, like all of these, it raises more questions than it answers, but it is a challenge to the rest of our people to get them thinking. And certainly, Alan, I'd invite you to some of the other sessions too. And at some point, when uh, we get better dialogues going on subjects like this, please participate. Uh, we would like all of you to understand that this will be available, as are all of the other presentations on YouTube via our website. It's up in a day or two. And also, uh, ask any of you who are not members already, uh, please subscribe. It helps us when you subscribe to our website. It makes it possible for us to keep doing it. We're now up to almost 100, and I, I think Art will tell you next time how close we are to 100, but we're going to celebrate the 100th uh, YouTube that we put on. So again, thank you very much, Alan. This has been very rich. It is in the totally consistent with the quality of speakers and dialogue we've been, been getting. And thank you very much for your, your, your contribution.